All right, uh, welcome back to the online causal inference seminar. Uh, today we don't have a talk, uh, we have a slightly different format. We have an uh, interview with uh, Philip David. Um, we're very excited about that. Um, we're going to have a few questions, and after that, uh, if we have time left, we will also take uh, a few questions from the audience. So please uh, submit your questions as usual via Q&A. Uh, today on the panel, uh, uh, Vanessa Delis uh, joined us. So before we get into the questions and into the interview, Vanessa will say a few words. Uh, Vanessa, uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to join this panel today. It is our great pleasure, also personally a great pleasure for me to have Philip David um, here um, to be interviewed. Uh, I met Philip, I think, in 1999 or 2000, around that time. Um, and uh, Philip had already been uh, started to be interested in causal inference at the time, but I wasn't interested in causal inference, then I was interested in dynamic models, and uh, we figured that those two things have one thing in common, they are non-symmetric, uh, as opposed to um, stochastic independence or stochastic dependence. So we started working on this, and nothing much ever came out of that work, but it was still the beginning of a fruitful collaboration for many years when we were both at uh, University College London. But anyway, by then, Philip had already made many uh, important and impactful contributions to many aspects of uh, especially the foundations also of statistical theory and methodology. He likes to deal with paradoxes uh, and things like this. Um, in his very early work, he already um, considered selection effects, selection biases, etc. Um, but uh, so um, uh, he has also uh, received many awards um, then, and I want to mention, especially in 2018, he uh, was elected Fellow of the Royal Society. So that was a special honor uh, at the time, and I think well-deserved. Um, to come to the subjects of his work, um, the audience here will mostly know him for his work on causal inference. But in fact, Philip is one of those researchers with very, very broad interests. and. Uh, it ranges from um, many contributions he has made on probabilistic expert systems already with many graphical aspects in there to the foundations of, of Bayesian theory. He's a big fan of uh, Definetti and subjective uh, Bayes, uh, including also Bayesian decision theory. And he has also, for example, worked on the probabilistic aspects of legal and forensic um, evidence and, and science, uh, working as a um, uh, expert witness and, and advisor, uh, for example, on DNA profiling. So one of the things, and this brings me also to my first question, one of the themes that connects many of um, Felix, uh, Philip's um, research uh, themes is conditional independence. Uh, and so one of your first major breakthroughs uh, at the time in the late 70s was your paper on uh, conditional independence. And in fact, there were three papers. One was a companion paper, much more on the theory and, and measure theoretic side, and another one on misleading arguments. And I wanted to start by asking you how you came to work on the topic of conditional independence. Thank you, Vanessa. Well, um, and thanks, everybody. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to say a little bit about the things which have interested and excited me over the many, many years of my career. And Vanessa is absolutely right that one of the unifying threads of many of the different things I've done is this idea of conditional independence. Now, like many other things in life and in statistics, uh, this sort of got started by accident. Uh, and I'll tell you, when I first started to think about it, when I in the early days, when I was recent just appointed as a lecturer at University College London, um, there was uh, uh, a very eminent uh, physician called Wilfred Card, who organised uh, a, a, a twice yearly meeting between very uh, a number of eminent doctors and statisticians from my department to try and understand various things to do with. Uh, statistical prediction of disease and things like this. Uh, 
And one of the things I started thinking about was uh, the probabilistic structure of diagnostic processes. Um, and um, in particular, how they respond to maybe selection effects, because uh, you don't usually see a random sample of patients in your specialist clinic. Um, and when I started thinking about this, it turned out that um, a good way of thinking about the effect of selection and what it did and did not not affect was, was to do with thinking about dependence and independence. And from that very early start, in fact, the very first paper I had, which had any ideas on conditional independence, was properties of diagnostic data distributions. So it was very much focused on that particular area. And there was a little appendix in that where I actually, for the very first time, did some formal manipulations with conditional independence, though I hadn't yet uh, introduced the symbol for conditional independence. That came when I'm in, so that got me interested in the general topic. And then I started thinking about the logic and theory and foundations of independence and conditional independence. And that ended up in my, uh, I guess it was 1979 paper on conditional independence in statistical theory. Uh, and one thing which uh, has also been an important aspect of that is the realization that whereas we usually think of independence and conditional independence in terms of random variables, they didn't all have to be random. So you could have a, a, a is independent of B given C, where B or C could actually be things like parameters. And uh, I was able to think about statistical concepts like sufficiency and ancillarity and predictive sufficiency and things in terms of conditional independence, where some of the variables you're playing with don't have to be stochastic, but they could be indicators. And uh, that proved very useful. And although I didn't know it at the time, it proved particularly useful when handling things to do with causality. Because later on, these non-stochastic variables are used to talk about different uh, regimes, if you like, different contexts in which you were thinking about the other variables. And the, it turned out the formalism and the rules of conditional independence uh, work just fine with these non-stochastic variables and, and we could get lots of useful results out. So in, in 79, I introduced the symbolism, the notation, which, which, which took off in a big way. Uh, I also had quite a lot of theory about it, which I don't think took off in quite such a big way. I'm probably one of the biggest users of the theory. Most other people, I think, unless they're dealing with graphical models, where they're dealing with graphoids, which are essentially the same. But outside the context of graphical models, I think people are a little bit slow to uh, simplify things by using the general theory of conditional independence. Yeah, so uh, nowadays, this is your uh, some of your most cited uh, work. And um, we can see this from uh, knowing about graphical models, et cetera, how important uh, it became. Did you know or did people realize at the time? How was it received um, at the time, uh, this particular topic with, with all its potential? Uh, slowly, I think, is the way to phrase it. Um... And although eventually, as I say, the, the notation become, became pretty well ubiquitous, I, I still think the theory is waiting to, for people to notice it properly. Um, yep, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a slow burner. Okay. I'll hand I will, over. The other thing is just to mention that when I was doing that, I had no concept whatsoever that there might have been graphical connections. It wasn't until Pearl came along and pointed out the graphical connections and graphoids and everything that uh, that, that made, of course, a very big difference and, uh, and a lot of headway. But but of course, it has its existence way outside the graphical context as well. Okay. Okay. I hand over to Ying or Pinyan. Uh, yes. I Can I ask a follow up question on this? Um, I guess for our generation of researchers, we just took conditional independence as sort of for granted, and we, we thought that's sort of where a lot of things uh, start from. Uh, so I guess personally, I can't uh, sort of wrap my head around why this was not studied before 1979. Um, 
given its importance and usefulness? And, and maybe there are already traces of this, uh, but can you sort of tell us a little bit of the history before your work? Yeah, I think there was, I mean, there was very little history. I think, I, if I remember correctly, I think Terence Fine played around with some abstract properties of marginal independence. Uh, and and um, but you know there are there's a little bit you can do there, but it only really becomes interesting when you extend it to conditional independence. And and before then, and maybe even since then, people still play around with probability densities and uh, and, and don't take the shortcut, which uh, which is the simple uh, algebraic framework, which allows you to do things much more straightforwardly. Why did it happen earlier? Well, whenever it happened, you could always say that, couldn't you? I don't know. Thank you. Um, so the next question, we want to like go a little bit back to color inference. Um, so can you tell us how you became interested in color inference and maybe also your your early days in statistics? Yeah, I'll tell you my very first con uh, contact with causal inference and it, was, it goes back to around 1970. And Don Rubin was visiting my department and he gave a seminar. And he talked about what has now become his very famous uh, representation of causal inference in terms of potential outcomes. And uh, this was before he published any of it. He was still working on it. He didn't publish it till two or three years later. And I sat there thinking, uh, this is just wrong. This really is what a bizarre way of thinking about things. And Don and I have a very good personal relationship, but we have argued and disagreed about that particular aspect about the usefulness of potential responses and counterfactuals ever since 1970. And I don't think either of us is going to convince the other one. So that was my first contact with it, but it just lay dormant for rather a long time. I'm just thinking of my, my notes here about, yes, there was an, um, an early interesting paper in 1984 by Pratt and Schaefer which they call something like the nature of discovery of structure. And uh, that was interesting and thinking about general aspects of uh, uh, observational studies and, and, and causal inference. And uh, I made a, a discussion contribution after that paper. And uh, I, there are things there which I don't think I would do that way now, but I did think I did at that point realized that you could use conditional independence to describe and play with some of these concepts, which I did there. So that was uh, 84. Then, then it sort of lay fallow for a long time. Um, I got very interested in graphical modeling, purely associational graphical modeling. Uh, we used to call it in those days probabilistic expert systems. Um, so I did, did a lot of work on that. And Got through through that. Got to know uh, the work of Yudha Pearl. And got to know him personally too. He's a has been a great uh, academic and personal influence on my life. Um, and so I, I followed his work. And of course, then after a while, he moved from purely associational graphical models to causal understandings of graphical models. So I followed that too. Uh, and I've been simultaneously incredibly impressed and also a little bit skeptical about what Pearl has done there. Uh, and yeah, Thanks, so then, then, and I, then I started doing more work, more work on it uh, on my own, trying to understand the fundamentals, uh, both in terms of the, the philosophy uh, uh, and fundamental background of it, and, and showing how uh, a different approach than the one that everybody was using was actually very helpful and very useful, and in some ways more streamlined um, than... than uh, Either the potential response or the or the graphical model approaches. Thanks, Philip. Uh, continuing on from that, actually, so this question was submitted by Hido Imbens, who couldn't be here, unfortunately. So I'm asking it in his stead. Uh, so he said actually that he was one of the reviewers on Uda Pearl's 1995 Biometrica paper that you handled. And that despite negative reviews, you published the papers, and moreover, you invited some of the reviewers to publish comments alongside the paper, which has never been done before in Biometrica. Uh, so he does said he viewed this as a very inspired decision as an editor, and clearly showing better judgment than the reviewers. And he said that this showed how an editor can actually make a difference. 
And so how do you feel about your editorial work in general and the, these types of decisions? Well, I mean, that paper in particular, I think, was probably one of the high points. I was very proud to uh, promote that. Um, and uh, the reviews were, I mean, yes, they, they were negative, but they were uh, they were also, um, they made contribution, important contributions. I mean, I went, just went back in the last couple of days and I looked at the paper and the discussions, many of the discussions, which were similar to what was in the reviews. And and I think it's it, it's worth doing that to read both the paper, which was fabulous. I mean, it basically introduced new calculus uh, in some quite complex uh, contexts, uh, and it, it's a wonderful paper. Uh, but but I think it's also worth reading the discussions because they do point out, you know, some of the other things which maybe also need to be emphasised. Um, so I guess what I thought about that, I mean, I'd I must have I think I must have met Pearl. Yeah, I certainly met Pearl personally before. Then and I was impressed by him, and I realized this was important. And just because people had uh, interesting things to say about it didn't mean it should be rejected. And so, it was, luckily, it wasn't, and I, it was pretty foundational, I think. Um, but of course, the credit goes to Pearl, not to me. Uh, what about, about my activities as an editor? I'll tell you one of the things, one of the activities I did, which I found. At the time, I thought, um, whether rightly or wrongly, thought was quite important and would now seem absolutely ridiculous to you. This was before anything was online. So when it, when it was time to sort of produce a volume of Biometrica, I had each of the papers I'd accepted for that volume in a galley, printed galley. And I would take them all and I would lay them out in a line on the floor of my office. And I would spend quite a time permuting them until I was happy that the order made sense. And that there was a there was a sort of narrative of the volume. And it, you know, what came before and after a paper was important. Now, when you go online, you hardly ever look to see what's before or after a paper. And I think we've lost something there. There is a there can be a narrative in a printed volume. In principle, you can you, you can go what previous paper, next paper, or whatever, but you but you don't see connections. And quite often, uh, in those days anyway, it was quite important to, to have volumes with, which had some sort of theme, or even if they didn't have a theme, you get papers which you could make into a mini theme. And, 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 and uh, you know, I think we lost something in just going online. Okay, thank you. Um, let's uh, return to your skepticism in, um, in causal inference, um, which you expressed in your famous uh, 2000 uh, JASA paper on uh, causal inference without counterfactuals. Um, so this was actually a constructive paper saying, how can we do causal inference without counterfactuals? Um, can you explain in a nutshell? <laughs> I know that you can do several hours of talking about this, yeah. but can you explain in a nutshell what you meant? Well, maybe a coconut shell, maybe, we'll see. Um, <laughs> but but I'll, I'll start by saying there is one thing that uh, Don Rubin and I do agree on, and that is we don't like the misuse of the word counterfactual. Uh, most of the time it's misused to mean potential response, and something isn't counterfactual until it is counter to a known fact. But, but let that pass. Um, but so let's say causal inference without potential responses. Now, I don't need to tell anybody here that potential responses is big business and that probably the vast majority of uh, uh, theoretical work in statistical causality still works with potential responses. And I thought this was... Uh, well, I didn't like them, but also I thought it's completely unnecessary. It's making life a bit too difficult. So my my approach was this: the basic what I what I now call calls, um, causal inference. I, I I call it assisted decision making. So here's a story. Here I am wanting to know. For example, I got a headache. I want to know should I or should not take two aspirin to help my headache. Uh, I'd like to have some data which would help me make that decision. So I'm thinking ahead. Um, this is the decision theoretic ask. I don't make that decision, but in order to make that decision, I've got to think ahead to uh, what will happen. So I can. I got two different contexts, and this is where my 
uh, non-stochastic context variable is useful. Two contexts. One is the context where I, I'm going to decide to take the tablets. And I think ahead to the probability distribution of how long my headache lasts and any other variables I'm interested in. And there's a separate, di completely different context where I decide not to take the tablets. And I think ahead to what I expect to happen in those circumstances, how long I think my headache will last. That's all very well, but I want to have some information to help me understand those distributions. And I've got a lot of data, right? The trouble is it's observational data. Now I'm making a decision. So I'm, into, I'm thinking about an intervention, but because uh, I've only got observational data, which wasn't say randomized or, or, or decision imposed, it's much more complicated. But the whole, what I thought, think of as the whole task of statistical causality there is to somehow find a way of using that observational data. Oh, of course, there are rare, there are occasions when it is experimental data, but the point is to use the data I have in order to assist my decision making. So I could, if, if it were experimental data, I could use the data on those who were treated to help me understand what would happen if I took the tablets. And I could use the data on the controls to help me understand what would happen to me if I didn't take the tablets. All in turn, I could just estimate those probability distributions and decision theory says, that's all I need. I minimize my expected loss, take the two possible expected losses and do whatever gives me the smaller one. And the important point to make is that I have two distributions in, in two different contexts under two different hypothes, hypotheses about how I will act, about what my eventual outcome, my response, why shall we say will be. Two distributions for a single response. Unlike the potential outcome approach, which has a single bivariate distribution for two different variables. The potential response if I do and the potential response if I don't. And that turns out to be just a little bit too much structure. It's more than I need. Even if I believed in those potential responses, and I, as you know, I'm scared, I mean, if I did, I don't need them. All I need is two distributions for one eventual response. Another thing to say about that is I don't need, for somebody who was, who was in the data, let's think of the simplest case of experimental data, somebody who did get the treatment. Some people say, what I really need to know is what would have happened to that individual if they'd not got the treatment. So, uh, which would be a counterfactual. But I don't need to know that. I just need to know what happened to the people who did take the treatment to understand what will happen to me if I do. And I need to know what happened to the people who didn't take the treatment to understand what will happen to me if I don't. So uh, it's, it's actually very straightforward. And, and a number of things I've done is taking uh, problems which people have tackled using potential responses like uh, things like uh, Jamie Robbins' G computation, things like um, uh, instrumental variables, ver various problems which people have, uh, have thought needed all this additional structure, and not only additional structure, but additional assumptions about various obscure independences which are very hard to get your mind around. And so that actually it's all dead wood. You can get the same results with a much more straightforward approach. Do you want to say a bit about um, how it was received at the time? So I, I remember that I have a selection bias. You weren't the only one who was very skeptical of, of uh, potential outcomes and counterfactuals. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Well, the discussion on that paper, on my uh, paper on causal infrastructure counterfactuals, with one exception, which was Glenn Schaefer, uh, was 100% negative. So, uh, nobody liked it. Um, and I don't think the position has changed a great deal. <laughs> uh, and Glenn Schaefer didn't like it that much either because he thought I didn't go far enough. Uh, but uh, I've been making the case with the whole string of papers uh, ever since then. Uh, um, well, it would be nice if it were to become a bit more popular, shall we say. Well, I, I think there has been development of the uh, potential outcome methods to be more careful about various things because of 
these uh, the, the skepticisms uh, and the unnecessary assumptions, don't you think? Um, are you thinking of swigs by any chance? <laughs> yes. Possibly. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, there's lovely, lovely work by Amy Robbins and Thomas Richardson, which, uh, which is very, very, very close in many ways to the way I would do things, with the one important exception that it still does contain potential outcomes. And uh, I would still say, as I, as I say to all the other applications of potential outcomes, well, okay, people seem to like that, but it's, it, it's just an extra frill which doesn't really add, add value. Okay, I'll hand over. Ooh, the next question. Yes. Um, so switching uh, a little bit to uh, Bayesian methods, it, it seems that Bayesian methods are not as frequently employed in causal inference as in many other areas of statistics. Would you say this is surprising, given all the appeals of the Bayesian interpretation of probability and probable inference and the massive de development of computational methods for Bayesian inference? Yes, it is. I mean, it's it's an interesting case, actually. I mean, of course, there is there is there has been and continues to be Bayesian work in causal inference. In fact, one of Don Rubin's very earliest papers uh, was about uh, Bayesian inference for his sort of scores. Didn't he call it something like Bayesian inference and the role of randomization, something like that? I, I'm not got the title right, which was which was interesting. Although, but 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 my feeling is that the the principles of Bayesian inference and the principles of causal inference are somehow orthogonal to each other. They don't really impinge very much on each other. Uh, Bayesian inference, I think, does have some problems with causal inference, but partly because mo a lot of causal inference is pretty non-parametric or semi-parametric. And, uh, oh yeah, we do have semi-parametric, so can't say semi-parametric ways of dealing with things in, in in the Bayesian world, but I think one one of the one of the interesting issues which I haven't completely got my own head around is to do with um, um, things like propensity scores and understanding uh, the assignment mechanisms and things. Which, if you take a thorough Bayesian approach, basically um, you can say it doesn't matter. It shouldn't it shouldn't affect your inference. You're just conditional. And, and we know that you can do a lot of good frequentist things by taking a lot of account of those things. So so the straight Bayesian approach seems to be has to be quite far removed from um, frequentist approaches. Uh, or there's a lot of machine learning aspects going into that now. Uh, and I don't quite understand how that should be. I think I think the main problem is we can't deal with the with the very non-parametric aspects of causal inference very well for the Bayesian approach. But but uh, maybe somebody will crack it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vanessa. Would you like to ask the next question? Yeah. So uh, um, one of the Non-parametric aspects and causal inference is, in a way, as graphs. Graphs are used to uh, um, assess, for example, non-parametric identifiability. And um, also regarding graphs, so I always get the, the skeptical questions. <laughs> um, one thing is that you um, also have an alternative way of looking at the role of graphs, and uh, you've developed your approach based on inference diagrams. Um, can you explain a little bit your attitude here and, and what do you think, what should graphs be used for and how should they not be used? Well, I think the important thing about the graphical representation is it should be very clear what it's saying. So, um, and one of the difficulties is that we have, a, we have very different interpretations of the same graph. For example, you can draw a directed acyclic graph and think this just represents purely associational probabilistic conditional independence. That's where we started really. Or you can think of it as a causal graph and, there are, and, and you can say it, can, it represents things like direct cause and causal pathway and, and things like that. Things which are a bit it's not very clear sometimes what it is those things are supposed to be that the graph is representing. Um, um, and then there's, there's Udipel's interpretation, which uh, is very clear, 
Um, but but he still but my my main complaint with that is he still uses the identical looking graph for his causal interpretation as as one would use if it were purely associational. So my my understanding of DAGs is pretty much. I think along the same lines as, as Pearl, except I insist on adding additional variables to make it clear what's going on. And those additional variables are non-stochastic indicators, indicating, for example, for a particular variable, whether or not it's intervened on, or does it just arise naturally? And if you put those explicitly in the graph, it has a lot of important uh, advantages. First of all, it makes it clear this is not an associational graph. You can tell the difference just by looking. Secondly, the assumptions which uh, underlie uh, the Perlian understanding of the graph say that um, essentially that any variable, its distribution conditional on its parents should be the same whether or not those parents and other variables are intervened on. They are actually explicit that the uh, the same uh, deseparation semantics you could use for regular conditional independence applied to these extended graphs tells you exactly what the assumptions are they're built in. So uh, uh, and one additional aspect is you don't have to be able to intervene everywhere. You can have, there's no reason to think that every variable in the system is intervenable. You just put in the appropriate uh, indicators for intervention wherever it seems that, that they should be. Uh, uh, and you can do, you can make, you can simplify the uh, the understanding of the deseparation uh, um, axioms, for example. It's a bit, it's a bit more straightforward to understand when you add the intervention uh, aspects to it. In fact, in fact, it's almost it becomes completely trivial. The other thing I'll say about graphs is that there is uh, a even Pearl has more than one understanding. So sometimes he uses probabilistic uh, relationships of a variable dependent on its parents. And sometimes he used deterministic relationships with some additive external errors, or not additive, but additional external errors to where all uncertainty is, is handled in these sort of exogenous independent errors. Uh, and he gets what, what Pearl calls a structural causal model. And uh, I think, I don't know what these external errors are. I don't see what use they have. They don't seem to be important for the uh, analysis. And uh, um, there's also an ambiguity if you try and use them for genuinely counterfactual inference. So uh, I try and avoid that. Um, you also sometimes give this argument uh, regarding reification uh, when people use graphs. Um, yes, I mean that is what they uh, they say the mistaking the the map for the territory um, that uh, so for example th th this is I think happens a lot in um, causal discovery algorithms. So the way a cause of typical causal discovery algorithm works is that you where you look for uh, uh, say a directed acyclic graph that representing conditional independences. And let's say we found one, jolly good. We may have found many, but let's say we just found one. Uh, great, we have discovered causality. Well, no, we haven't. We've discovered conditional independences. But what we have in the picture, for, for better or worse, we have arrows. We have a graph and it's got arrows in it. Now, although conditional independence is an entirely symmetric uh, property, somehow or other it's represented in this non-symmetric way with arrows, which have heads, have heads and tails. And there's a very strong temptation to read more into that than there is. That surely if an arrow points from A to B, then it means in some sense A affects B as a causal interpretation. So it's very easy to take, as it were, um, just construction lines of no particular importance in your map. It's like, it's like thinking that if you look at a map and you see a contour line and you look on the ground, you're going to see that marked out on the ground. I mean, it's it's not there. You know, it's 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 a construction thing, and, and it it gives you important information, but it's indirect information, and, and that's why I I think you've got to guard against what I reification is taking something which is 
an incidental feature of your representation of imagining that it has to correspond to something in the real world. Okay, um, there's a question in the Q and A. Should we ask this maybe now? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, I read it out. Um, so it's a question from Sasha that framed. Um, my question is about Knightian uncertainty. Back in 1921, Knight and Keynes argued that for most everyday decisions, we have no data for decisions. Does subjective probability offer a definitive answer to this problem, or do you feel that there is still an open problem here? Well, there's many of the cases where we have to make decisions with no data, and we do. And what do we do? If, we, if we're trying to do it in a semi-formal way, we think ahead to what might happen if I make one or other of the various available decisions. We're back to what I, I was talking about earlier, the decision theoretic approach. Um, if we don't have data, we just, well, we use our subjective opinions as best we can. Uh, it's nice if they can be grounded in data. and. Uh, I, here I would say if we do have data, ideally, if we have data we can regard as exchangeable with the situation at hand in the definitive sense, then we can uh, use that to or, or almost construct uh, frequencies type probability as objective probabilities, that at least frequencies in the data I have might be relevant to my decision problem. Um, so I've actually, I, I'm a thorough definitist. I don't believe in more than one kind of probability. All uncertainty is probability and all probability is one kind. Uh, but you can, if you like, interpret things like frequentist probabilities in terms of limiting subjective probabilities given appropriate large databases. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Should I continue, Vanessa, or do you have more? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, going back to a, a high-level question and, and summarizing uh, some of what we discussed a little bit. So it, it seems that you've been continuously drawn to the conceptual foundations of our field. Um, so one question is now, has your thinking about causal inference and Bayesian statistics evolved over the years? And uh, if yes, how has it evolved? Um... I think it's matured. I, I don't think it's changed in any important way. Uh, probably the uh, the basic directions which I've been following were set pretty early on. I think it probably goes back. Well, I mean, I, I joined the uh, the department, at University College London, with Dennis Lindley, uh, one, one of the very few Bayesians at the time, was the head, and then it was. Uh, I, I'd already started to have. Bayesian leanings, which is why I joined that department. And of course, uh, they were strengthened there. Um, and others like Mervyn Stone were very influential. Um, and in particular, uh, 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 a short time after I joined, Nindley invited De Finetti to come and he, he, he spent, uh, he, he gave a lecture course on, uh, on his approach to essentially the sort of thing which is in his two volume book. Uh, and I've found that very influential and I still very much have that in my blood, as it were, that very, it's a very, I mean, it is a bit of an idiosyncratic approach. I mean, it's whether you like it or not probably depends on where you, where you were brought up and what university you went to. If you're Italian, you probably like it. It's definitely did have a big following there uh, and some following outside. But uh, I don't think it's even now has had the the impact which which he deserves. Um, okay. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Also, you also said that my my understanding of causal inference developed much the time. Well, uh, it's it, it's yeah. I guess it has developed, but but not in different directions. It's just really been exploring the ramifications of my particular point of view. My, my, early, my early work was in, entirely in the context of purely experimental studies, and uh, which was quite a lot to say even there about statistical causality. Um, but then, of course, uh, I realized that the important context was observational data and moved into that. 
Okay, I, I want to actually connect a little bit with this and, and return to your, I mentioned your early work or your, your other interest in forensic and legal reasoning um, uh, probabilistically, but that is also connected with causality, which is some of your um, uh, most recent work in causal inference. And um, I think there's a bit of counterfactual reasoning sneaking back in there. Um, can you tell us a bit about how causal reasoning and, and the forensic uh, legal reasoning goes together? Well, I would tell you, I mean, like I said earlier, things things get started by accident, really. So why did I start getting interested in anything to do with legal reasoning and forensic inference? When I was appointed to uh, be professor at University College, I had to give an inaugural lecture. And I, I, I thought uh, there was sort of a problem. There was definitely type ideas. I thought very round, round and about probability and its uses and misuses. After I'd given the lecture, a few days later, I got a message from the newly appointed professor of jurisprudence, a fellow called William Twining, who had been in the audience for the simple reason that he was going to have to give his inaugural lecture soon and wanted to see how it was done. But he got very interested in some of the things I was saying. And it turned out that I didn't know this. There'd been some discussion in the legal context by lawyers of the uses of probability uh, in, in criminal trials, shall we say. Um, so we got together and that turned into a very long standing relationship. Um, and uh, I think when we both realized that there was much more in common between statistics and the law than either of us had ever understood, uh, we both realized that one of the important things was to make sense of a mixed mass of evidence. That was what both, both subjects were about. So I actually ended up teaching his students about use of probability in the law, and that got me interested in theoretical and methodological aspects. And the very fascinating logical issues about making sense of, of, of legal cases and understanding. Um, anyway, what, what, what happened after that is through that, I actually got an invitation to be an expert witness at the Old Bailey in London, the Central Criminal Court, of uh, one of the very, very first cases involving DNA identification. Nobody really knew much about it at the time. So I had to mug up a bit of background statistics on it. I mean, make and make up something. Uh, so I, I've been, I had done a few cases like that. Anyway, then I got interested in modeling DNA, DNA identification. Uh, that was a big thing. I spent quite a long time um, on, on, on modeling DNA. And uh, much, much later, I think I started getting interested in aspects of legal liability when uh, the question is uh, not, not a question of fact, like was this the person who committed the crime or not, but a question of cause. Uh, was this medication what caused this side effect? Uh, which is a big uh, important aspect of a lot of, lot of legal cases. Um, so that got me interested in what I call the, uh, the other side of causal influence, which is thinking about not effects of causes, which is the big thing, which is... Uh, what most science is about, but causes of effects, which is what most of law is about. And uh, I've made, a, a, I think, quite a, a, a big play about how these are really quite, although related, they're quite distinct, uh, some enterprises. Uh, they have a little bit in common, but they have much more difference. So I've, you know, I've played around since with, with ideas of understanding effects of causes, uh, sorry, causes of effects. And um, I think one particular aspect there is that you are still not wanting to use any assumptions about the joint distribution of counterfactuals. Well, I mean, there are some, there are some, I, I, I am a bit perplexed. I mean, I still don't think we really understand this problem at all. I certainly don't. I mean, I've, I've done some formulation of it and it sounds like uh, you need counterfact genuine counterfactuals. So, the, the legal uh, requirement is to prove something but for. So, but for uh, Miss X having taken this drug, uh, she would not have got this nasty side effect. That means 
she did take the drug and she did get the side effect, but we want to think what would have happened if she had not taken the drug. And that is a genuine counterfactual question because it's counter to the known fact that she did take the drug. Um, so it does sound like we need to play around with counterfactuals there. And the various ways we can do this. Um, one of the problems is that it's easy to build models for this, which assume far too much. But if you're trying to uh, use data, then it's generally only very uh, imperfectly identifying. Even, so even with vast quantities of experimental data, um, you, are, you generally can't identify the, the so-called property of causality. Uh, you can get bounds on it. And, and I've done work on this, and Pearl and his associates have does, done work, work on this. Um, but I think, well, speaking for myself, I think it's an area which is very poorly understood. Okay, more work to be done there. I think the foundations are very unclear. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, before we continue, I just want to remind our participants to please submit questions via, uh, via Q&A. All right, so we're now coming to uh, two trends. So over the past few years, as, as you know, the machine learning community has shown like a huge interest in causal inference, and there's a staggering amount of work that has been produced. Um, and this interest has fo focused on various aspects. Um, but just from your opinion, like what potential benefits and pitfalls do machine learning and big data offer in, in, in the context of yeah, causal inference? Okay, well, I'm... I, I, I'm, I don't have great knowledge about machine learning and big data, um, but I can see that there's a lot going on there. Um, of course, one of the things is, is just more and more ways of uh, interrogating data, if you like, to find associations, predictions and associations, which... Uh, uh, and then there's always the question about how do you turn those into causal inferences. Um, so I guess it's a bit like causal discovery. It's on, on a big scale. Uh, and uh, the question is, is that justified? And I, I've always felt the causal discovery is quite a good way of generating hypotheses. You, you tread through data, you come up with something, say, here's what it seems to be saying, let's test it. I'm not quite sure how much testing is actually done because testing actually would typically involve experimentation and intervention. But I, I'm seeing that more and more work is being done in cases where the data you've got does maybe have at least some of the data were collected under uh, experimental conditions. So you can have different contexts, different kinds of interventions. And so if you could do causal discovery where you've got a various kinds of data, including genuine interventions, then you might be able to get out some uh, some genuine causal understanding. Um, so I think that's coming, and I, I, I'm I'm sure you know there are a lot of brilliant people working in those fields. Um, they'll if they haven't got the message yet, with a bit of luck, they will soon. All right. Um... Maybe a lighter question now. Um, so, what would you say, or maybe not actually? Uh, so, what would you, uh, what would be one contribution of yours that you would maybe choose as your favorite? Oh, golly gosh. Um, hmm, that's a toughie. I'm, I'm, I'm very keen on quite a lot of them. Well, I suppose I, uh, I'd have to go to my con my conditional independence paper, basically that because that was the foundation for so much of of what I've done ever since. Yeah, my my. So that would be uh, conditional independence in statistical theory. Great. Um, and I guess, do you have an example that you like? of a possible success story in applications of causal reasoning that you'd like to point out? Yeah, I, 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 when, when I saw you sending this question ahead of time, I thought, what is, the, what is the biggest success story in causal inference? And I thought, it's Dolan Hill's understanding that smoking causes lung cancer. And that didn't use any of the modern theory of causal inference whatsoever. So where does, where does that leave us? <laughs> 
I mean, it was, it yeah. was basically it was basically what you might call triangulation of lots of different studies sort of, of cross sectional and 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 some uh, and doctors who stopped smoking and there's all sorts of things and and just putting it all together with with, with Bradford Hill's uh, ideas about you know all the different things you think about when you do causality. So has the modern the more modern theory of causal inference had any great successes? Uh, well, I'm sure it has, but but I still go back to Dalton Hill. Thank you. Um, for the next question, um, it's more about uh, advice and mentorship, which may be of interest to students and young researchers. So what advice do you have for students today? Uh, and what topics would you encourage them, including me, to work on? Well, I mean, personally, I've I've always been wary of bandwagons. I don't like jumping on juggernauts that are. I mean, they're, they're they're always big, popular enterprises that are happening at any one time, and there's a great temptation to join in and and and, and work. And and you know, there's always work to be done in these areas, but it's it's actually very hard to make a very big mark. Uh, because so many people are, are doing so many many things and sometimes you know sometimes maybe this juggernaut is going to veer off the road and go crashing so be careful so I, whether it's good advice or not I don't know uh, may not be a good advice for a strong career path you've got to make your name in areas where where people think it's important whether it's important or not but my advice will be don't take things too seriously think of for yourself very hard about about what it is is important uh be be very individualistic awesome thanks um yeah one of the last question now that i that we have here is now uh, again submitted by Hido Imbans, uh, who again yeah, can't be here today so just generally like speaking, are there any other areas of causal inference that you are uh, enthusiastic about, uh, like with new developments, or like maybe also skeptical? I uh, can go in both directions. Um, well, I mean, as Vanessa's pointed out, it's, I'm famous for my skepticism. Uh, so there are some directions I'm quite skeptical about at the moment. Um, one of them is uh, the uh, attempt to re. Uh, direct um what's the medical decision making in in in, in terms of uh, things like uh benefit and harm defined in terms of counterfactual understandings uh which moves away from standard decision theoretic approaches so i think this is thoroughly misguided i think we have the simple tools we need uh and they're not improved by adding extra complications. But I do find, I was talking about bandwagons, I feel that there may be a bandwagon gathering, gathering speed here. Uh, and I wonder how, how long it goes off the rails. Uh, one question from the audience, if I may, uh, about continuing on the advice for students. So Karen Martin asks, Given that the field appears to be segmented, so we have quite a lot of views on causal inference uh, active, uh, how would you recommend a student uh, get into the field? What should they start with? What should you start with? Um, Fisher. I would say one of the, mo the most important contrib contributor to causal inference was Ronald Fisher, who, uh, in, of course, is almost entirely in an experimental context. But unless we understand the important aspects of causal inference in the experimental context, it's premature to move into the, uh, the more complicated aspects of understanding how to make causal inference from observational data. So they've got this whole wonderful enterprise of experimental design, much of which is actually untouched by a lot of the more modern causal inference things, all these, these wonderful complicated uh, fractional factorial experiments and 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 mul multiple hierarchical levels of of, of uh, experimental unit and things like that. Um, I think there's a lot of wonderful stuff there. If you take that seriously and think about how that can be developed and generalized, 
uh, into new directions, that will be very useful. Thank you. Uh, we, have, we have one question from Ed George. Um, there has been a lot of recent work on selective inference, um, proposing a variety of adjustment for selection based on frequentist considerations. Given your earlier Bayesian work on this topic, what do you think about this work, if you have thought about it at all? Uh, well, I thought about it a little, but not very much. I'm not. I'm, I've not followed it that closely. Um, of course, the the Bayesian approach typically says you uh, you condition on the fact of selection, but not on the process whereby the selection came about, which is different from the frequentist approach. We'll have to model the selection process. And it's a bit like in causal inference, it's a bit like modeling, modeling the assignment process. And the Bayesian would want to condition on that. Uh, so I think um, one of the things I found, but one, there is a problem for the Bayesian here, which is that uh, once you've done that, there tends to be much greater sensitivity to your prior assumptions. So you can, uh, you've got to worry, worry very, very much more um, uh, 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 about your about your prize in order that they matter very much more when you're modeling problems with selection. Um, so Bayesian inference in principle is straightforward, but in practice is rather difficult in those fields. All right. Uh, I actually have one more question, uh, maybe also related to mentoring, maybe more towards junior faculty now. So I guess um, what would be kind of the mentoring lessons that you have learned or developed based on your experience that you'd advise junior researchers maybe take up or invest time in? Well, I mean, obviously, it, Mentoring is a very personal relationship. It very matters, very much matters how you get on with somebody. So you might have uh, an official mentor, but maybe not as important as an unofficial mentor. So for example, in my own case, my official mentor, my PhD supervisor was Dennis Lindley. We got on really well and we, you know, we, and we both, I admired him enormously, but the guy who really influenced me was Mervyn Stone. Um, he was another professor in the department. He wasn't, he didn't have any official responsibility for me whatsoever, but we discovered that we uh, we had lots of interest in he and he's been a model for me uh, ever since, really. So I guess the important thing is choose your mentor well. It might not be the one who's assigned to you. There are some more questions coming in in the Q&A, um, but they might require some lengthy answer. <laughs> Do we have more time? Or am I... Yeah, we, we have a bit more time. Yeah, it's okay. Do you want uh, to read? I can also. I, I can read out um, one of them. Uh, what are your thoughts about axioms that go into causal inference, like uh, independent latent variables, faithfulness, etc.? cetera? Uh, it seems that some sort of prior over the complexity of explanations could offer a natural solution to these problems. More generally, what are your thoughts about how causal inference could get off the ground, so to speak? This is from- I mean, there are axioms and there are, uh, I don't know, representations which may or may not be at an axiomatic level. So, Independent variables in, was mentioned. I've, I've already talked about those independent latent variables. So uh, that's not at an axiomatic level. That's trying to model something, and it may or may not be successful. For the most part, I don't find the idea of so-called exogenous error variables uh, helpful. But other latent variables. Well, okay, fine. And um, with the particular priors using using maybe a subjective Bayesian approach um, to impose priors on those sort of structures in order to get somewhere? Well, the, I mean, if we're thinking about sort of model selection, priors over different models, yeah, I mean, there, there are plenty of approaches there. I mean, it's... Uh, 
It's not easy because you've got to do a lot of specification, um, particularly model selection. It's, it's you know, they've got we got lovely asymptotics for it, but uh, but infinity is very far away in most of these cases. So so you've got to be very cautious about how you model things and what priors you use. And as I was saying, if you if you are doing selection, then sensitivity to prior assumptions can be very very greatly in, increased, and you've got to be careful with that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, maybe it's time to like slowly uh, wrap up and like if we, you know, we can take some like more questions from Q&A after, after that. Uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you so much for the super interesting uh, interview, uh, Philip, and for taking the time. Also, yeah, thank you, uh, Vanessa, for, for helping us so much with the preparations also with being here uh, today. Uh, um, so also thank you for the audience for so many questions. Um, next time, we're gonna have a talk by Niels Richard Hansen, who will talk about uh, cyclic graphical models and causal learning. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, hope you have a great week and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>